2012. Please stand for the flag salute and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We can still stay standing for a moment of silence for our military personnel worldwide. Thank you. Okay. Any communication tonight? None there. Citizen input and community announcements. Uh, if anybody would like to come forward at this time for opportunity, uh, items that are not on the agenda, uh, please uh, fill out a yellow card and come on up. We have one. Uh, Bev? Good evening. My name is Bev Doolittle, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canby Chamber of Commerce. Um, I just have a question and um, a statement to share with you. I've received a couple phone calls from um, businesses in town a little questioning the fact that the city went out of town to purchase um, nursery stock. That um, there are, we are the, the um, can be the garden spot. We've got nurseries that could supply you with any kind of nursery stock that you guys absolutely could have wanted. If there would have been communication with these um, nurseries, I've been told that they would have more than willing help supply and provide things here. And the fact that the city went to Wilsonville to purchase the nursery stock, you've got businesses that are very concerned and upset about that. The only thing we asked of you guys when you started this project is to please buy local, to keep the money in this community. So when I receive phone calls from nurseries, and they've spoken to Rose, Ruby, the lady that's putting that in, to find out where this stock had come from. So they know for sure where it is and know that this nursery is out of town. And that concerns them. So I am here voicing that concern to you guys and um, just would ask that you please take this into consideration. The next project that you do, that you utilize the businesses that are here that give back to this community. So that's all that I have. Thank Any you, questions? Ma'am. No. I don't. Thank you. I would like to say that when we bid a project, um, state statute says that the contractor, we can't tell him who to get the lowest price from. And, or lowest, lowest uh, or, or where to buy it. We cannot specify local purchase. And so what he does, he goes out and does a bid, and then he is the one that's responsible for um, getting that product. We have some input, but we can't necessarily say, you have to use this supplier because it's a low bid. And I agree with you. I wish we could right. do it. I agree 100%, but we can't dictate who the, where they get it. And I don't think we can specify local. See, that is through the Canby X uh, contract, not purchased by the city. What we would have liked to have had happen is when the conversation started, that you in, in, that you asked Canby Excavating to do that if they were the ones that went out and got those bids. Um, you guys just stated at the last URD meeting that you didn't use the lowest bid for the um, library for the um, project manager that you're hiring there. So you have some leeway in looking at what it is that you're doing. I mean, we're the garden spot, and you bought nursery out of town. You have leeway in some respects if you do a qualification based, and that's what the sure. uh, the person was. You can't necessarily do a qualification based if you're telling Canby X, give us the low bid. And one of the things they live and die on is low bid. So sure. if they uh, go out and say, you know, we're going to use you, water X, Y, Z, within the city of Canby, they lose the bid. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't sure. know if they would or not. Right, and I don't want to argue the fact mm -hmm. here, but you guys mm -hmm. last week also said that you have $300,000 left in contingency. So mm -hmm. paying a little bit extra to buy the product that's raised here in our community that knows these, these nursery people live and die for this. And they're now pulling and burning their stock because it didn't get sold. They don't carry it over, so they pull it and they pile it. And, you know, they're saying, we, we could have given here. 
So well, I'm just we're giving not the back. Ones that dictate that. I what realize I'm is that. Can the yeah. X is the one that purchases that, and then you've got lo money left over. Um, that's a good thing, obviously. Right. And if there was some way that we could say, go to a local company, I guarantee we'd do it. And what we can do is try to research to see if we can. But I think we've done that on the police station. We said, let's dictate local, and we. I think the research said that we cannot do that. Right. But on I know a qualification I, I've done some research and trying to figure out how it is that when you go out for bids, how can we give um, extra points or whatever it is because you pay can be taxes, because you hire um, local employees, because of those yeah. things, you know. And I know that I was working with um, John Kelly on that, and it was a hard thing to come yeah. up with. So I'm just voicing to you guys sure. the questions, the phone calls that I'm getting, and the concerns <clears throat> um, that that others are having too. Over you know, this this was yeah. a big thing to them to have yeah. happen. I so, agree, and I yeah. wish we could have. It's a very passionate issue so, for sure. I, yeah, and you, know, you and I have had conversation about this as well, and and I, and yeah. it, it does put <laughs> hear hear your message, and hear those those nursery companies message as well that right you know and what the the, the joy of dealing with state statutes and mm -hmm. and those kinds of things and and um I, I know for i mean i don't want to speak for everybody here but i know that i think if we can truly um you know it was great we got canby x on this project wonderful and you know i think going forward like we did with the police station and hopefully with the library i think you know um <coughs> That company that we've hired or, or have contracted with will probably hopefully pull in some of those same contractors and and whatnot going forward. So sure, sure. It's not falling it, on deaf ears. It's the chamber, and our purpose sure. and our our goal is to keep keep it as local and give back to the community as much as we can. So I'm voicing to you the questions that that came to the chamber and letting you know here. So now we all know. Hey, Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Uh, Bev, I, uh -huh. I appreciate that, and 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 with deference to our city administrator, who says we are stuck with the law, and we do need to follow it. But if we don't like the answer to a question, we can change the question. Uh, and from time to time, lawmakers do ask us our opinion on these things. Um, you know, I can see us down the road. We'll be doing some more landscaping, whether it's dahlias or chrysanthemums. It sure would be nice to be able to buy those local. Right. So at the very least, I think, Bev, what, what we might be able to do is at some work session talk about as we put together a list of legislative issues that we want to bring before our delegation, of raise that. You know, maybe, it, maybe it is structured in a way <clears throat> that for purpose of fairness it can never be addressed, but I certainly think we can, we can share with our legislative delegation the fact that, that this state law gets in the way of us trying to achieve some of our economic development goals mm -hmm. and whether there's anything from a legislative fix that they can do to, tr to try and give some extra points sure. because certainly, you know, not to put too fine a point on this, but certainly legislators have enterprise zones where they draw circles around and say, you know, here's a special area where you're supposed to do something. So yeah. let, let's think about putting that on a, mm -hmm. on a schedule to, to talk about. and from time to time all of us individually right. get buttonholed by right. legislators and it's something to reflect on saying hey you know here's here's yeah. something that the business community came to us didn't like we have to follow the law can you help us that's right. a good point I, I we would love to do that and if there's a way we'll look at the library and if there's a way to do that I don't know how it is but right. we'll, we'll try and figure out some way to buy local uh, and I don't know how that is, but we'll research it, that's for sure. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Good point. Okay, and we go to Mayor's Business. I had a very light week. I have nothing to uh, state. Uh, let's see. We'll go to Tracy. I have a pretty light one as well. I did attend the Canby Visioning on the 15th. Um, looking forward to some more of those coming up. Is it December, right? Yes. Quick parts of December, we'll have some more meetings, so I'm hoping more community members come out and join us for those. And uh, Main Street Promotions, we had a meeting this week, and planning on uh, First Avenue reopening on Small Business Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. this Saturday. So come down, see the, the newly decorated First Avenue, and patronize the small businesses on First and Second. And that's all I have. Great. Great.
Uh, thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple things on the Planning Commission front. Uh, we are looking for a Planning Commissioner. We need one more. So if you are uh, passionate about city uh, development and growth and planning and have um, a background of almost any kind, we're uh, interested in talking to you. <laughs> um, we like uh, builders, engineers, and whatnot, but people with a pulse. Beggars can't be choosers. It's a, it's a good group, and you get to you know make really good, tough decisions. Uh, on a C4 front, uh, nothing to report at this time. Um, on some personal notes, the Cambys Light the Night festivities start up here in just a couple of weeks. Uh, they start December 7th. We have First Friday with the uh, our wonderful, are we calling it an electric parade or just a parade? Do we? Oh, I like electric. I like electric. Yeah. Yeah. Light the Night electric parade of some kind <laughs> and tree lighting, park lighting. Uh, and that's going to carry on to December 13th where the, uh, we're doing a huge Light the Night event at the Clackamas Event Center. Um, so if you go to lightthenightoregon.com, you can purchase tickets or go to the chamber and buy tickets for that event. We'll have Santa Claus, um, a um, highly interactive igloo slash um, snow globe, and uh, carousel and all sorts of fun activities. So bring the whole family down. And then, let's see. Oh, yeah, and on the 14th, the Gold Rush crew will be in town to do um, a little showing and one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with, uh, we're thinking, 300 of their closest <laughs> fans, if they would like. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I want to give a big thank you to the Canby High School drama and theater team for uh, a great uh, run of Our Town. It was fantastic. Uh, kudos to those guys. They do a great job and work really hard at that. And then uh, on a city note, um, if you have any leaves that are remaining in your yards, uh, request from the Public Works team. Uh, if you would not rake them into the street um, <laughs> and leave them for the street sweepers, they are working hard to get out to our streets and keep our uh, curbside and waterways, pardon me, sewerways clear. Um, so the less leaves that they have to pick up in the street, the better and faster they can get around town. So um, please uh, clear your leaves and not put them in the street the gutters. Recycle. Yeah, recycling okay. bins. Perfect. <laughs> and that's all that I have, sir. Awesome. Piggyback down here is uh, many times the person would just go out and take a rake and rake over the, the manhole where they covered the sewer there would keep from flooding their front yard. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay uh, two things. I had an active week at Historic Society. We had our annual meeting uh, Thursday night and elected officers, and they uh, I guess they figured the officers were good, and so they put them in for another year. <laughs> um, they have some changing displays there, and uh, one of them is uh, Mrs. Henry put up is uh, advertising from businesses from years past of Christmas uh, mm -hmm. ads. Mm -hmm. Took about this time of year and put up all these ads, and it's amazing to look at how inflation has affected some of these. But places like uh, Canby Hardware, Mangus Variety, uh, some of those uh, that are no longer in business and uh, see the ads and so forth. It was real interesting. So that's on uh, on display now, and and they're open on Thursday through uh, Sunday. And also on December 1st, uh, Santa Claus is coming to town and you get your picture taken with Santa. Um, also, uh, the transit, we had a meeting this week and uh, we found out that just that the in instituting the dollar fare has dropped the um, ridership down about 14%, but that's not bad because most people say they experience 25 to 40% drop off, but it's slowly picking back up. Um, they also, uh, ticket sales have been going real good. You can buy, um, call the transit office and purchase a ticket or that uh, discount. Uh, general public ticket price is $40 and you get a discount as a consumer, but that's only good for that month so you can't accumulate it. And then they also have for $20 uh, a ticket where you can get for, uh, you know, if you're not, if you're not a commuter and you need a uh, shorter uh, drive time. Um, so everything seems to be going pretty good. Um, I might mention that uh, we had a good representation from the committee at the visioning uh, on transportation. I mean, 
had a lot of ideas people had incorporated from the very first, and we were considering those. Uh, that, the meeting will be on December the 11th, and that's the development night. And isn't that, is that still in on? That's correct. Yeah. And so if you have any more input on uh, transportation, along with other things, uh, come to that meeting, and that's it. Is that going to be the police station? That's police station. Police station, I think it's 7, seven o'clock. Okay. So we've had a good turnout in the visioning, and so if you had a desire to say, well, I wish the committee would do such, 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 here's your opportunity to get out and make your wishes known, because this is a, a plan that may be used for 5, 10, 20 years down the road, and so we're interested in getting Craig and his uh, staff has done an excellent job of getting this across. We've had a good turnout for it. Good and, turnout. Uh, look forward to seeing a document. It's going to be a working document. So I yep. appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Chris. Thank you. Um, yes, along with the other some of the other counselors, I also attended the visioning meeting, and that was neat hearing uh, from other voices in the community. So I appreciate the efforts um, on that. Uh, working with the Main Street Group, Tracy has been doing some heavy lifting on the Promotions Committee. I appreciate that. Uh, trying to get some um, names coming forward to work on uh, two other committees that we want to try and fire up. And um, in terms of, of being thankful this Thanksgiving, I am thankful for my city staff. Uh, I was reading through the uh, management reports, uh, which, which were just delightful. Uh, Dan Mickelson, who is our, in our facilities, uh, saved $200 by going out and buying a piece of plastic pole uh, for an antenna instead of uh, buying it, I guess you, my dad would call it store-bought. Uh, that, that sort of cleverness I really like. Um, also, uh, in terms of sensitivity to 22% of our uh, constituents, um, Eric at the uh, Aquatic Center has now begun uh, marketing communication uh, in Spanish. And so I, I think those are just uh, a terrific, insightful uh, efforts that uh, are going on. So thank you. Uh, thank you, city staff. And also, thank you, city staff, in advance. <laughs> oh, I was the leader. Uh -oh. You got your pen out? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have a lovely First Avenue, but there's this little dip in front of Wallflowers, and uh, Mr. Ellis says that if, if, if nobody else will do it, he will go there and fill it in himself yeah. so that, that uh, Pam's uh, customers uh, don't get wet when they get out. So I appreciate you at your attention to detail on yeah. that. Not quite deep enough for a bath, but almost. There you go. Almost. If you're a small chihuahua, you <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor likewise attended the visioning meeting, was part of the development committee. Uh, very interesting. I have gotten quite the education in land use, sitting with a group of farmers who know a frightening amount of information <laughs> oh, about yeah. land use oh, yeah. of all varieties. And it's don't like really it. Good. So my yeah. thanks to the Montecuco family for the education. Right. It's been really good. Uh, on the camp utility front, uh, would like to put in a plug. Their Share the Warmth program is in full swing. You can learn more about it by going to cambyutility.org or reading in this week's Camby Herald. And a reminder to our community that donations to that fund are welcome and are tax deductible. And in past years, our community has been very, very generous to help their fellow neighbors stay warm this winter. Uh, the Knightsbridge substation is still in the permitting process, just getting out of the public comment period, so we're grinding through that. Uh, nothing there, and as I've already advised you under email, BPA has announced their rate increase for next year, as they do every two years. So stay tuned for that. Camp Utility will be doing rate hearings on that next year. So we're a ways off, just letting you know. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One comment I should have mentioned that uh, when he talked about, Mr. Parker mentioned the uh, Spanish we also have instructions on our website for the transit in Spanish. Gives them all a, you call the number and you hear Spanish V1 English and you press another number, but it gives them all the instructions. And uh, so far it seems to work pretty good. One of the things we have trouble is trying to translate cat into Spanish. And it doesn't come out right. So, but anyway, other than that, they're working through that. But we have a, a young high school student that's on uh, the transit board, he's dual-lingual tag, he can talk Spanish too, so we've had him call in and see if it sounds all right. So there's a difference between sometimes conversational Spanish and what you learn in school, so 
we want to make sure that this is accurate they get there, right? So yeah. it's uh, turning out real well to uh, have that. So good. Okay. Thanks, Walt. Consent agenda? Yes. Uh, got a short agenda uh, consent. Uh, move the appointment of uh, Andre, and I'm not sure the pronunciation, Chernisko. Uh, is, is that right? He's here. He's oh, okay. He's here. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps you could ask. Perhaps could you say your name for us? What? Chernishov. Chernishov. Okay, excuse me for that. Uh, to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board for term to end on June 30th, uh, 2013. Thank you, sir. Can I get a second? Oh, I'll second, second that. <laughs> it's been uh, moved by Councilor Daniels, seconded by Councilor Hodson to uh, appoint uh, to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. Andre Chernenov, sorry about that, sir. Uh, for a Parks and Recreation Advisory Board for a term to end on June 30th, 2013. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes 5 0. Thanks, Andre. Thanks for coming. Thank you. We'll work on pronouncing yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Um, now we have a, a public hearing on Canby Downtown Parking Management Recommendation Report. So I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And. Go ahead and have staff, I guess, go ahead and talk to us about what we're doing well, here. Good evening, and I would like to add my two cents worth about First Avenue when I was driving in in the evening. It's really well lit up, and it's very pretty. It feels very festive out there with all the new street lights down there. I, I just hadn't realized how many lights were going to be there, so it looked really nice and inviting. So I, I was kind of pleased to see that. So. Anyway, I'm glad we're all here this evening. It seems a little bit like we're on the, you know, eve of a holiday. It's a little bit grinchy, but um, I'm glad everybody <laughs> showed up. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that word, grinchy. Well, it is. It feels a little grinchy. We're all here, like, you know, Thanksgiving Eve. But um, I'm very glad we had a kind of a hard time getting everything squeezed in, all the different hearings and things. So, And I was very fortunate to have our consultant, Rick Williams, be able to show up tonight as well. So um, we're here to uh, hopefully adopt the um, parking strategies plan. It was basically a, a, a management plan for short-term and long-term parking strategies for the downtown. We did a, a parking study as part of the downtown plan in 2001, and actually um, Mr. Williams also um, um, did that as part of our downtown um, master plan. And when we looked at First Avenue, we knew, when, once we realized that the parking was going to be reduced uh, as part of the purchase of the railroad parking lot, uh, we knew that there was probably going to be more interest in figuring out how we actually manage parking in the near term and in the long term in the downtown. Um, and not just because of that, but just because as our businesses expand and grow, of which they seem to be doing, which is lovely, um, we know that there are going to be continual issues about uh, where to park and where employees park and what's the best strategies for us to pursue. Uh, so we managed to, um, we were fortunate enough to have um, the um, Transportation Growth Management Program um, give us a, a grant in order for us to, to engage in services of uh, Rick Williams Consulting to help us um, work out a strategy for how we get to their short-term, long-term for the downtown. And so we had several meetings and, and we had several um, interviews with stakeholders, but I would like Rick to just kind of to come here and just going to kind of walk us through to remind everybody who's probably familiar with it by now, but just walk us through the recommendations from that and hopefully it will give us a framework to move forward in the future for how we approach parking in our uh, downtown commercial area. Okay. So with that, turn over to Rick. <laughs> Mayor and Councilors, um, good evening. Um, I'm thankful to be so I'm thankful for, for the work that uh, I would be able to do for the City of Candy. Uh, my name is Rick Williams. I'm the principal in Rick Williams Consulting. Uh, we're a parking and transportation consulting firm located in Portland. And as Matilda indicated, uh, we did the original um, downtown parking management plan in 2001. Um, and it was great to receive the phone call and say, could you come back and, and help us out and take a look uh, at, what, uh, at what's transpired in the 
the last 11 years. Um, before we get into this, real quickly, what we did in, in 2001, we did a pretty detailed um, uh, numerical count and numerical uh, uh, analysis of how your parking was working. Um, license plates uh, surveys, a 10-hour uh, collection of data on every block face on every street in the downtown at that time. Um, unfortunately, the TGM grant didn't, didn't allow us that opportunity uh, to go back and do it in that much depth. But we did come back and do what we call the qualitative analysis. We came back over two days and simply uh, uh, my business partner and myself actually spent four hours one day in your town and just walked it. Um, we didn't have to have a whole bunch of surveyors out. Then we came back again on another day and did the same thing. Uh, and took visual observations of what was happening in the frontage lot, uh, tried to assess what would happen with the loss of that frontage lot, and then looked at all the different areas of the downtown um, in terms of how they were being utilized, areas around the park, areas in the core, um, and tried to compare that qualitative data to, okay, what has really changed since 2001 to today? So I want to put that on the table. It wasn't as detailed of, a, of an analysis. What was more detailed this time was the work with the stakeholders groups. Um, we did interviews, I think we did 10 one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, a selected group of stakeholders that city staff provided us and, and the folks at DLC, DO DOT uh, um, partnered with us on it. So we, we did those interviews one-on-one uh, -on -one, and then we had two uh, stakeholder workshops where we invited, or Matilda uh, invited um, citizens from the downtown to come down and be with us and we walked through what I'll walk you through today their issues and concerns, their vision for the downtown, um, how they thought managing should, should work, what are the challenges and the opportunities that are, are out there right now. So the first question, these are some of the questions that we asked the stakeholder group was, in the first place, why manage parking? Canby is a small to mid-sized town and, and it, it's got a great main street. Um, and so first we had to talk about and educate you know, why manage parking, what's wrong? Um, then, uh, once we, we got consensus, and you'll see in these slides, of, of, of why people agree that parking should be managed and can be. Um, and then we went through and said, okay, now that we're going to manage it, what is it we're trying to address? What really, um, not, a, not from a quantitative point of view, but from a qualitative point of view, what really bothers you about parking uh, in Canby, and what you think will be hot points in the future that we should, we should address? And then from that, we developed a series of recommendations and parking solutions based on what we consider industry best practices for managing parkings in, in towns of your size. Um, so the first thing is, why manage parking? Um, um, getting the right people to park in the right place. Um, that's a big issue uh, in Canada. And you'll see it in the issues and concerns. Um, uh, parking, if you have a ma parking management plan and you have a strategy to manage parking, you can put people in the right place. In other words, we have a lot of people saying, there's employees parking in front of my business all day long. Um, and um, we're, we're not thinking through what are the best places for customers to park and how do we assure that the customer gets the spaces and minimize conflicts between customers and employees. Um, managing parking is important because you're trying to manage a very limited resource. Canby doesn't have a lot of off-street parking and that off-street parking got reduced uh, when uh, the First Avenue project went forward. And the only parking that you really can't grow is on-street parking. So it's a finite supply. Once you've striped it out to its highest efficiency, then you've really got to manage it because it is a limited resource. And so you want to manage it as efficiently as possible before you have to add new resources into your system. Um, one of the things that reason to manage parking is because customers, um, they feel angst uh, when they come into a downtown. And if they, they don't find a parking place quickly or feel that they know how to use the system, they, they get angst, they get anxious, and that, that is the front door to your business shouldn't be uh, uh, an anxious response to visiting Canby. You should take that angst away and the customer should feel really uh, that everything is uh, ordered, everything is certain, and is convenient. Um, there's an economic reality of parking as to why you want to manage it, and we ran these numbers for Canby um, that when you turn over a parking <coughs> stall, it's usually a customer. The, the high turnover is a customer. A customer has money in their pocket and the customer wants to take the money out of their pocket and put it into the, um, into the hands of the shop owner. Uh, if an uh, employee parks in a stall all day, it turns over once. Um, and generally, uh, an employee will spend money, but they don't spend what um, towns of Canby size 
uh, customer spends. The average customer coming to a town like Canby, some people come and window shop and spend nothing. Some people come and shop and spend a lot. But the average is just about $25 a visit. So every car that comes in that's a non-employee car generally is worth about $25. So if you can turn a stall over four times a day, so the average stay being two hours, that's $100 a day per stall in retail sales. So the value of that stall in that finite resource that we talked about is about $52,000 a year in annual sales to the retailers in, in, in downtown Canby or in any downtown of this size. Um, and so there's a real, we think, incentive for businesses to agree to point number one, which is getting the right people to park in the right place. Um, it's a way to provide uh, also over time, if you manage your parking well, um, and uh, it's Councillor Daniels was talking about transit. It's also a way to augment your transit system and get people to think about other uses. As parking becomes more constrained and we, and we look for ways to make it more efficient, we manage it well, those other options, biking, transit, car sharing, ride sharing, etc., become um, uh, more convenient and more attractive to those who might want to use them. What I like about managing parking is if there's a plan, you can react. Otherwise, we are speculating. Otherwise, we are behind the curve. Uh, and so if you have a parking management plan, it allows you to calibrate and adapt to uh, situations that you've already anticipated, uh, as opposed to saying, oh, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, I always remember the scene from Apollo 13 where they're sitting in a room with all the paper bags and stuff because they're trying to fix the problem at that moment. A plan will give you a way to fix it uh, in advance. And the last one is really important, and it goes with number one and number four, is if your employee is not walking, your customer is. And so it's really important to manage parking because for what we're trying to do with our on-street system in particular is to make this convenient and, and friendly uh, and productive and profitable for, for customers and, and visitors and, and the businesses in downtown. When we talked to the stakeholders, we had two stakeholder meetings. And the first thing we did was really, um, uh, first was get an agreement on why we wanted to manage parking. So that slide you just saw was something that the stakeholders said, you know, that really makes sense. So what they're recommending is that, that framework is why, why we want to embrace this plan. Um, but here's the things they were saying. And this came from the interviews and from the stakeholder workshops. Is that there's a need for more structure and consistency in Canby's system. Right now, it's kind of haphazard. Uh, you have some streets that are striped. You have other streets that are not. We find that the streets that are, streets that are striped, there are people park more. Where the streets are not striped, people avoid them. They don't know whether they can or cannot park there. That's, an, that, that's sort of an example of structure and, and consistency. The messages that we're sending are sometimes um, contradictory or the messages we're sending are not providing enough information to our customer to allow them to use that downtown in a way that um, makes their stay friendly. Um, interestingly, um, number two on the list, and it's probably number one, was a need for enforcement. Um, the stakeholders were saying that any system that we we create, if we don't enforce it, it won't work. Um, and as a parking consultant, I have to agree. Now, the challenge for Canby is how much enforcement, when to provide it, and how do we pay for it. Uh, and the plan, actually, the, the written plan, gives you an outline for how to do that, uh, based on a model that is in place in Hood River, Oregon, uh, and another model that's in place in Springfield, Oregon, uh, where they're using, um, rather than having a full-time enforcement person, uh, person, they're contracting um, with a city staff person to provide in Hood River 25 hours of enforcement a week and they simply have to provide it Monday to Saturday, uh, well Monday through Friday and one Saturday a month. The pattern of the 25 hours is random and so that's how they, in, in Hood River, they've been able to get more out of enforcement without having to have a full-time MTE directed towards it. Um, need to have specifically dedicated employee parking. In a minute, I'll show you a slide. Uh, the stakeholders said employees are going to park on the street in many cases. But we want to make sure that there's employee parking areas so that it's not all one parking area in one section of downtown so people who are on this part side of downtown have to walk this far. They challenged us, and I think we met the challenge, to find three places for employees to park so that we reduce the amount of walk time that they would have and equalize and be equitable about employees who work in here, employees who work here, and employees who work here are all being sort of treated the same in terms of their walk distance. So that was the challenge they gave to us. 
it's important, I think, for everybody to know that uh, all the stakeholders acknowledge that employees and business owners are parking in front of their businesses and that that practice is detrimental to the downtown, um, which gets to the, the next point. Everybody needs to commit to honoring a plan. Um, I think that was uh, the criticism of the 2001 plan is people thought that it was a good plan, but no one was really dedicated or committed to um, making it uh, succeed. Uh, some of the uh, recommendations that we make today were some of those were also in the 2001 plan. So I think it's important. I love the acknowledgement. Yeah, some of us in this room, not this room, but the stakeholders are saying, some of us in this room are violators, but if we all get to, together on a plan, uh, we can all make it work. Uh, lack of consistent communication of parking expectations. Uh, some businesses that we interviewed said, um, I never knew I could park there, the unstriped streets. Or I never knew this about parking. Or what happens if? And because um, I don't know how to communicate that to my customer. So more of a, uh, a simplified, easy to communicate, this is why we do it, this is where businesses park, this is where customers park, this is where employees park, is something they're asking for. Um, and then relative to the construction project itself, which is significantly underway, uh, they were just at that time, there was a lot of angst about the project itself. And they wanted an ongoing conversation, sort of like weekly check-ins, in, check a web page, a newsletter, things like that. We may be beyond that now, I'm not sure. So getting into solutions, what we tried to do with our solutions was correlate the solutions directly back to the issues and concerns stated. So that as we looked at a solution, we could say it's just not something we pulled out of a hat. It's something that specifically addressed the concern that you raised as a stakeholder. Uh, so the first one was that issue of uh, structure and consistency. Um, and began with that issue of enforcement. One of the things the plan is recommending is a random enforcement program. Uh, that's structured along the lines of what Hood River and Springfield do. Uh, both of those towns are doing it with existing city staff uh, for something under 25 hours uh, a week. Um, and um, the, the days that they enforce uh, are random. There's not a specific pattern, which kind of keeps everybody guessing. Uh, so we're recommending that. I think everybody in the stakeholder group said, uh, if we get to a plan, the first thing we have to agree to is that we won't enforce the plan. User friendliness. Um, as we as we got out there, you can see some of the signage that that we have here. Uh, the slide, the, the picture on the bottom right, um, again is a, an example of this was a nice summer day that we were out there. Um, the rest of downtown had a, quite a bit of parking on it. Not a single car was parked on this block base all day. Part of the reason is that there's no striping. It looks like it's a throughway. If we had the little, we call them, we, we, we call them hockey sticks. You've seen them painted on, and you've got them in your town. We think that that is what a customer needs to say, you can park here. And then you complement that with what we would say, the uh, a signage package that you see up above there on the right, that's from Springfield. Um, it's a signage package that, it, as compared to some of the signage that we have in town, it, it, it leads with the P, which is the universal um, symbol for parking. It's the international symbol for parking, the, the blue P. And, and then, specifically, you can park here for two hours, you can park here for three hours. You, uh, any off-street facilities you have, you use the same P to designate public parking off-street. And so, every, the customer becomes oriented to the P and the amount of time I'm allowed to stay. And you can incorporate that package on and off-street. So, we're saying if you had uniform time stay signage and a common signage <coughs> brand, that can then be translated both on and off street. And we think anywhere on a public street outside of a residential zone where you allow commercial parking to occur, you should mark the street. Um, and then I think that we get to the user friendliness uh, pretty easy. Dedicated employee parking areas. Um, and you'll see a map here in a minute. We're recommending that um, on street in certain areas of the downtown, that we establish employee parking areas that allow for 10-hour parking, and they would be signed as such. They'd be signed 10-hour parking and strike. Discuss the option of a remote church lot option and use of the cinema for event parking. But we felt that the cinema still was too far away, as was the church option, given what the stakeholders told us. They wanted about, excuse me, about a 600-foot or so lot distance 
for employees to, to get to businesses. Um, so we think the church lot is still an option in the future, particularly as growth occurs, but not at this time. And the cinema lot is really not what we would consider a daily employee parking area uh, because of its distance. It works for that in the town, but uh, its distance for the reg regular employees is, is probably not good. So this kind of gets you a, a, to a start of what we're recommending. And I apologize for the colors. Um, but what this is, is our recommended layout for parking in your downtown. Anything that's yellow, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll come up here because I, I apologize. What we're recommending is uh, starting with two-hour stalls. Anything that's green would be signed two-hour parking, much along the lines of that Springfield package that I showed you earlier on the on-street the on -street signage package. Anything that's yellow would be signed three-hour parking, which is a little bit of a longer-term stay option for a customer. Anything that's pink would be a 10-hour option. So note, and then I'll show you what we call a walk-off isochron. Just these one-third of what's currently the, um, um, uh, the new frontage lot would be 10-hour stalls, but the rest of it would be short-term. 10-hour stalls around the park, 10-hour stalls on this end of downtown, and 10-hour stalls over here. Now what we did to make sure that there weren't be any conflicts. When we went out and did the qualitative observation and compared it to the occupancy data we had in 2001, other than here, most of the 10-hour options were very low parked block faces. In other words, they were very under parked and they, and they were, in, in fact, sitting highly underutilized. What that led to, and, I, and this looks like a mess, <laughs> but this is the 600-foot walk ice clock. So everywhere, we took central points of business points in the downtown where, where employment might be and where an employee might have to walk. And every time you draw a circle, so if you're parked here, it's 600 feet to here, it's 600 feet to here. If you park here, it's 600 feet to here. Same thing, if you park, if you park here, it's 600 feet to here. If you park here, it's 600 feet to here. It's just a series of what we call walk isochrons. And, and what it does is it shows you is that by even though we're pushing employees this way, and keeping the core pure for the customer, we're giving employees, one, multiple options to park and a walk distance that their employers were saying was reasonable uh, for them to walk. Taking into consideration weather, darkness, um, and, and topography. So um, that was a recommendation we had. And so if we go back to this slide, our recommendation to city staff is as over time as signage packages were one affordable uh, and an upgrade to the street system can be made, that we begin to transition this into um, these type of parking options. What it does is it very simply it simplifies your downtown too, very much so. You, you have two, three, or a 10 hour option. It's very simple. And they're clustered in such a way that they almost act as, as pure districts. Commitment to honor a plan. Uh, the stakeholder work group really worked well. Uh, our recommendation is that they would stay together uh, and that possibly the mayor would appoint or uh, charge them with further action, hopefully in partnership and led by the Main Street group. Uh, but we have a downtown parking work group uh, doesn't necessarily have any authority or even yet, yet we might not even call it an advisory committee. But to begin working on this plan, to meet on, on regular intervals, it doesn't have to be every month, but to meet at least three to four times a year, talk about the plan, talk about issues and concerns related to parking, talk about how the plan is rolling out, and it, I think really it, it's a way for businesses to talk to each other. Because one of the things we learned in a city like Gresham, and you'll see in the bottom right hand corner, Gresham has what they call a customer first program. And through their downtown booster group, they meet uh, on a regular basis. Uh, they form as a parking work group. And they talk about parking and transportation issues for their customers. And what they found is those issues about employees parking on the street began to resolve themselves when they could look each other in the eye and say, it's almost self-enforcing. If you, is it okay if I tell you your employees are parking on the street? Uh, it, it, and it, it began to work itself out. They created a logo now, and they identify their lots as customer first visitor lots and customer first employee lots. So kind of the same scheme that you, you saw um, uh, with the 10 threes and the twos, they've done with, with their downtown through the customer first program. 
Um, the work, and the, another thing that we're saying is that as a part of that process, then the, the work group would agree to a strategy of business to business visits with work group members going out and meeting with businesses. One of the things that we were a little disappointed about with the work group sessions was not all the businesses were there. So if they're not coming to us, we need to go to them. And through the, again, through the Main Street program and through some peer to peer uh, visits through the work group to other downtown businesses. Uh, we believe that, like Gresham, uh, a very simple, open um, a system of communication could occur uh, between businesses. And the city's role in that would be to, to be more of a facilitator of, of bringing that together. Um, this one, again, I think may have resolved itself. This was directly uh, related to um, the First Avenue project. Um, and these were the recommendations that the work group had made for the ongoing conversation uh, about just the status of the project and where it was going. And, and changes that might occur that businesses need to know about. In the midterm, um, what we're recommending back to structure and consistency is that the city routinely reports on enforcement actions uh, and, the, and the results of such to the work group. Uh, this would be a way that as enforcement starts to occur, we could say, because um, sometimes as these start things rolling out, who are getting the tickets? Is it really a customer or was it an, an employee? How many tickets were written? Um, uh, it's also the ability to create uh, a lot of cities that launch enforcement, they generally begin it not as a, a, a true enforcement system, but as a warning system. So the ticket that goes on your car looks like a ticket, but it's actually not. It's an information piece. And um, so, uh, again, um, routine reporting and, and, and checking in with the work group. Um, we think that the city would be well served if um, a website uh, attached to the city website would be access um, can be or getting here or a button that um, a customer could push that would pop up that map potentially. Uh, have ongoing information about events. Uh, if an event is occurring, park here. Uh, on a typical day, we have two hour stalls, we have three hour stalls, we have off street lots, we have 10 hour stalls. Um, but a sort of a getting there exit, uh, Vancouver, Washington has what's called destination downtown. Punch that button in. Transit information comes up, parking information comes up, but it's something very consistent, but it is also uh, very well managed. Um, and then we believe that if the plan were adopted, um, within six to nine months uh, after the construction project ends on the front, uh, on the First Avenue, is that you might want to come back and reset your baseline uh, in terms of seeing where those parkers, those stalls that were eliminated, to see how that's dispersed out into the into the um, downtown itself. So I have a set, uh, did we create constraints? Where did the constraints go or did it tend to fix itself? Uh, but uh, having a baseline of information to begin with is good and then checking in every two years from your baseline as to see how you're progressing in terms of occupancies and constraints. Long term, uh, marketing communications, a lot of this comes from the 2001 plan. Uh, a comprehensive wayfinding system uh, coming into the downtown from the major access portals into downtown. Um, again, going back to the, the Canby uh, example, um, particularly on the off street lots, you have the P, free parking, and then the address uh, of the off street lot. Uh, so, first and grant, or whatever the access point is into that lot, you would have on major access points coming in. Uh, downtown circulator system, this was something that was really highly valued in 2001. There was a lot of talk about it. And at that time, we put it as a longer term plan as well, simply because they're expensive. Um, but uh, all the businesses said, again, that they're very interested in a downtown circulator. Um, and um, they felt that trying to get one initiated with an event schedule would be better than initiating one as a routine daily uh, circulator. Uh, and there were some really interesting examples. I think, Mayor, you were there. The idea of when uh, events are bid out or events are planned is put into the requirements or as an incentive requirement that the event coordinators provide shuttle services uh, to uh, remote lots mm -hmm. and to other areas. And that's where the church lot and the, then the, um, the cinema lot would become more relevant. Uh, residential mitigation, long term, eventually, as downtown is more and more successful, um, what I like also about the 10-hour stalls that we have out there, they're kind of a buffer to the adjacent neighborhoods. So again, we're letting employees park more in the commercial area so they won't spill into the neighborhoods.
But I think uh, a longer term plan uh, and discussion that could occur with the work group is do we need um, residential permit programs? And if we did, what would they look like? But again, as you see, I put it as a longer term solution. It doesn't seem that there's issues from residents that we heard about spill over into their neighborhoods yet, but it's always something that can occur as growth occurs. I bet you do get those during events, though, because uh, I'm sure people will spill into the neighborhoods on events. But in terms of a regular day, uh, we weren't hearing much of that. And then finally, the idea of new supply. Um, another thing that this plan looks at is some opportunity sites where future parking structures could go, but again, there's enough flex in the system, we believe, both quantitatively from 2001 and qualitatively from what we've seen in terms of how the downtown has evolved, that you're still not there yet, unless you have a cash cow um, to put into it. Um, but I, in terms of new supply related to vertical supply, like a garage, we don't think you're there yet. But it's always something, two things to think about in that regard is, when we get there, even if it's a 10 or a 15 year plan, where would we put it? So the city in its comprehensive planning begins to think about protecting or assuring that the piece of land that you would like it to be on is still available to you. So that's always good to talk about. Um, and then what are the trigger points that would uh, lead us to become more aggressive in our discussion about creating a, a parking garage? But I think at this point in your evolution, it's really more of a thought about where a district garage would and could be and best serve the downtown if your uh, occupancy demand became so high that you needed one. And with that, that's our plan. Uh, we'd be glad to take questions or... Questions? Question. 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 Did you address anything about cost of signs and that type of thing, or did you? Look yes, at we did. Uh, the, the larger plan actually has a block face by block <coughs> face um, uh, analysis of what, how many signs you would need, what they would cost, and we even counted the number of hockey sticks you'd have to paint on the street and gave you a price for those. Uh, 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 Councilor, I can't remember the cost. Well, that's right. Now, I guess it was something like We did a block face by block face on every block that's referenced. Right. Yes, so right. signage and striping. I guess I've got a couple of comments. Uh, one thing about it, I think what you made a few comments on is we can change the hours and the uh, and the areas if it doesn't fit. If we look at it in right. six months with the uh, parking group, uh, downtown parking group, if they come up with suggestions, we can take them under advisement and uh, take a look at it and see if we need to move it, you know, ten parking spots different or, you know, change the hours on, on a few or, you know, just change it back to two hours yeah. only. Uh, and I think the other one is, uh, I think the honor plan is don't park in front of your neighbor's business. I mean, you know, yeah, you don't want them to park in your business, but uh, right. it just if you go down to two places and park in front of their business, you've basically taken their parking spot. So Absolutely. business owners and employees need to make sure they uh, honor the Absolutely. honor the idea of, of not parking in front of any of the businesses. Absolutely, Mayor. And I think that's one of the reasons that by having a signed 10-hour stall, it goes back to that there's a couple of the businesses that we interviewed that says, what do I tell my employees? Yeah. Or what are my expectations? What are the city's expectations of me? To have a striped stall that says 10 hours, then they can tell their employee, yes, there are options for you. There are reasonable options. You should park there. Right now, there's no 10-hour stalls, really. And so employees, really, when they look at the on-street system, it's either I've got to find a place off-street or I've got to park in one of those two-hour stalls. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to park in a two-hour stall. So you're absolutely right. A couple of questions. Uh, in the packet, because uh, I came across this when I was down on First Avenue, some of the parking stalls seem to have this two-foot gap in between parking stalls. Can you explain why there's this two-foot gap between the hockey stick sometimes and the, and the T-style uh, right. parking? I, I haven't seen those counselors. I haven't been down here yet, but I'm guessing. Um, oftentimes in striping, it's the size of the stall and then it's how you stripe it. So sometimes you put the, you, you actually see parking stalls that have, there's the two where you park your car, and then there's this like uh, um, an oblong line. Actually, it's the distance between cars that's most important. So what I'm wondering is, even though you have the two foot gap, is whether the entire stall, if you go from the midpoint of the two foot gap to the midpoint of the two foot gap on the other side, and if it's somewhere between eight foot six inches and nine, eight foot six inches and nine feet, it's actually, that's the size of the stall. Now, if you, 
I'm guessing, if you go out there with your, your measuring tape and you measure that same gap and it's 10 feet, then that's not, that's not efficient. But sometimes, it's, I, that's what I'm saying, Counselor, it, it could be deceiving. Some parking stripers like to put the buffer there because it makes the, the customer feel as though they have more space. But again, it's, without a tape measure, I really couldn't perfectly. And that was the explanation. But that's my guessing. That's that was my guessing. explanation that I got on that because I was curious because somebody had asked me the question, like, if we were if we had squeezed those gaps down, would we have been able to add more parking spots? And so I, I was just curious of right. Well, another you know, way to in, answer in the, the presentation on, here, so I was you know, curious on that. But another way to answer the question on street counselor is there's a believe it or not, there's a controversy in the parking industry right now about whether you should stripe your streets versus whether you shouldn't. Um, so you look at downtown Portland now with those smart meters, more and more of their block faces, they're removing the striping from the street. Uh, because they think they can get more cars in it. Uh, and, and I'm an old school guy. I think a customer wants to know, and uh, I'm also now approaching 60, and so I want a target. <laughs> and, um, but so the controversy is you can get more cars on a, a block face if you don't stripe it. So sometimes, you know, whether you have that two-foot gap counselor or not, but what I, my philosophy is on one day of the year, you may get ten cars where you could have gotten nine. But I think throughout the whole year, you'll get more cars on that block face if you strike it. Uh, because all i got to do is get a big dually to come in the first car to park in the morning. I put my dually about right in the middle of the block, and then the next person is going to park four feet away from me because I don't want to be up against that really. And then someone's going to cart right up on the butt of that car, and then all of a sudden the block face is inefficient. So I hope I answered your question. But no, I, you I did. Think it's I... more, get the tape measure out there, and, and that, it'll solve it. Um, so a couple other questions. Looking at um, the color diagram that you had up there regarding the 10-hour and the 2-hour parking, right. um, question that I had was looking at um, the, the section that is between Grant and Ivy, um, and it would seem to me, and this is where you know, you're, you're the, uh, the consultant and the expert, of putting the 10-hour parking and sorry, that's a little, okay. A little farther east. So, so no, on First Avenue. First Avenue. Yeah, so that, so yeah, so we got two hour parking in that yellow, no, on first and the pink. Avenue. Flipping those because These are three. Is that three hours? These are three hours. Okay, okay and the Yellow's pink is. Yellow. And the, the yellow pink, is three. I'm sorry. And pink is ten. And pink is ten. So, so the pink section next to the yellow there on First Avenue, and flip flopping those because it seems that we have less, yes. more parking available right there in front of those particular buildings. Yeah, was, I'm you know. glad you brought that up because our original plan that the consultants took the work group did exactly that. The pink was on the end and the yellow was here because, you know, these are businesses here. Mm -hmm. um, it was the work group who said that it was that goal of that walk isochron, the 600 feet. If we don't have the 10 hour parking here, and I think it's a judgment call. Okay. But going to the charge that the work group gave us, not that the council gave us. They said, if we don't have this small amount of parking here, and it's, it's actually less than one third, but if we don't have a small amount of 10 hour parking here, the walk isochron from, from a business here for their employee, they felt was too far. Um, so I don't have a great answer to your question. How about if we, you put it in the middle? We actually recommended that, yeah. and the work group preferred it this way. Because you see, whenever I drive downtown on First Avenue, that, you go wrong with that's you the, that, that area of the parking lot is the most empty, the most often. Yeah. And so uh, for now, um, that's, again, if, what was, why was 600 feet the... Good, the, that's a great question. The, the magic number. We, well, we went, we went to the, um, the work group asked us what's reasonable. And so we actually went to the National Research. And there's actually been market studies done on the distance that people prefer to walk um, as a matter of changing their behavior. So people will walk farther. But what we found is that if you are going to say, we have new rules here, and we want you to do something, that that, that 600 foot walk isochron became something that um, we could find in the research and find in the literature that says, now we're going to tell our employees, you have to park in these areas. So the national research is saying it's reasonable it, it, and that um, it's a distance that is hard to disagree with, and therefore I will change my behavior to do it. Um, so that's where it came from. Okay. Um, but again, I want to go back to your point uh, in terms of flip-flopping um, 
the, the first avenue lie. I think it goes back to what the mayor is saying. There's flexibility in this plan to make those changes. We could start with them, just like you said. We could start with them, flip-flop them, and then six to nine months find out that the employees are still not using them, and then maybe we make that decision with the work group to do it. Um, so, but again, you're seeing this because this was the work group's preferred sure. alternative. Sure, and, that, and that's, I don't want to, so I was just I, I think you're right, I mean, again, that's, prime, that's probably the most prime customer space to those main businesses. Mm -hmm. Have we as a as staff, Greg, have you guys already started to look at how would we go into the enforcement piece of things, started to look at who, what, how that would be? Uh, We've talked at a point two five. Yeah. Uh, we FTE. have talked about it, but not in the terms that you brought up tonight, which I really like, mm -hmm. because that means not putting uh, more employees on, maybe using what we've got. So okay. we have looked at that. Okay. Uh, but but in the terms of hiring new employees, and we're thinking, I really I mean, like what you said. That. Good. We didn't want to so we have talked about it. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, because co uh, when I read the enforcement piece and the the dollar figure, I was definitely more intrigued on how we, yeah. there's a, um, a person or labor hours that can be squeezed to max, you know, and so that's, um, and then, w if adopting all these strategies, when would we look to pull a working group together or a, uh, a uh, an advisory I committee? I think mean, immediately. Okay. We should reconvene the group and, and maybe ex even expand to see if there's new people. Because one of them now has moved down on the highway. Uh, Fritz and Sure. And, um, <laughs> they were involved. But are pretty still one of you. I think we should follow. We just immediately at least sit down and say, here's, here's the plan, refresh everybody's brain, and, and kind of share the principles of what the group would be uh, doing. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, I think what Rick is saying is really a good idea to touch base after this is the dust settled with First Avenue, see how people are actually shopping and parking, go back and probably in nine months and touch base and say, anything has radically changed or things sort of settled and you see how people are actually parking. The, uh, the, sign, the sign package that um, we've talked about, the, uh, it's, is the strategy being, um, like looking at the green area being that shorter parking span, would that be for <coughs> whole block faces, um, business specific, you know, I mean, could a business say, hey, I really need more than a 10 minute parking spot right in front of my my business the, is that a case the, by case piece the intent is that um, and I, again I want to make a, a, a small change the intent is that we would start with yes this whole block face would be two hours this whole block I'm sorry this whole block face would be three hours it's yellow this whole block face would be two hours we actually have one whole block